And it's 1.30 p.m. right here in Lagos, Nigeria. Same time in London. Coming up on the program. IMF World Bank holds first meeting in Africa in 50 years, all the way in Marrakesh. And Kenyans borrow 20 billion shillings airtime in four months. Zimbabwe moves to cushion its economy with gold-backed tokens. Welcome to the program, Ladi Williams. Let's kick off with the markets. Now, first up, equities uh, market right here in Africa. If you see there, the NGX. Not a bad way to start off the week at intraday there. Up almost 1%, 0 0.95. Um, that's the number there at 67,000 points. And we see South Africa's index on the flip side. Uh, huge, uh, big drop there, 2.16% uh, for the GSC. Other markets we track now, see the Middle East uh, EGX there, 0 0.29. That's in North Africa. Uh, pardon me, 19,412 points. That's for the EGX 30. And we see uh, Kenya there closing negative. Uh, that was on Friday, down 1.69%. Uh, Let's um, head over now to the Middle East. See market sentiment there is mostly red uh, right there. See Abu Dhabi and the UAE Abu Dhabi index down big 1.24%. Dubai index, same there, massive drop 2.59%. Must be related to the issue we have there with uh, the Israel Hamas uh, conflict. Saudi Arabia not left out, marginally down though, but the Qatari index, uh, that's uh, down a massive 1.65%. All right, let's um, head on there to Marrakesh. Uh, earlier uh, on Business Morning, I did speak to um, any John McCoy. We see the IMF and World Bank, uh, they gather in Morocco today for their first annual meetings on uh, African soil. That's in about 50 years. Uh, under pressure to reform, uh, to better aid uh, poor nations blighted by debt and climate change. Uh, we have our very own Ini John Mekwa live at Marrakesh. She's right there uh, giving us updates as they roll out. But this afternoon, I'll be speaking with Henry Ugu, IMF uh, fellow, um, right there. Great to have you on the show, Henry. Thank you. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Good to see you, Henry. So, um, as a fellow of uh, IMF, uh, what do you hope to achieve uh, from the meetings? So I think that inclusive growth is critical at this point, especially now that Africa is ripe for a lot of economic growth. So Africa has a lot of countries that have emerging markets. And it's important that we begin to engage in this conversation at the global level. And the only way we can do that is to build financial literacy. And we cannot achieve that without a wide communication effort. We need to communicate to the Nigerian public and to African youth to understand the importance of financial literacy. They need to know how economic policies are made and how it affects them. I believe that we want the youth who are more in number in most African countries to understand this, then we are getting it right. All right, as an, as a Nigerian in the IMF um, fellowship, talk to me about the kind of conversations uh, you're having about the Nigerian economy, the way forward, you know, debt issue and inflation. So the conversation has been diverse. There's a conversation around inflation, because of the pandemic and as a result of different economic policies. There are conversations about this. There are conversations about but for, the, for, for Nigeria, it is important that we find policies and make policies that will help reduce poverty. I am not always counting uh, usually when things really, really are going bad in the country. And right now that Nigeria is next to debt, I am not in debt to support, to help. And that's the conversation that has been going on, how I am is coming in a very African country like Nigeria to help offset some of the debt and also help us resuscitate the economy. 
All right, thank you so much. That was uh, Henry Ugu, IMF uh, fellow there, uh, talking to us about uh, conversations uh, right there in Marrakesh. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. All right, so let's um, head on to London now. Uh, we have our correspondent, uh, UK correspondent, uh, Juliana, standing by uh, right there. Great to have you, Juliana. So we see Rachel Reeves. Uh, she's speaking at the Labour Party's annual conference in Liverpool uh, today. What are you hearing? What's the plan to increase uh, economic growth? That's actually right. Good afternoon, uh, laddie. It is uh, party conference season in the United Kingdom. So last week uh, we had the Conservatives um, spelling out their plans for the nation in Manchester and this week's it is the turn of the Labour Party who of course have been in opposition for the past 13 years but according to any poll you read um, in the UK um, they are the government in waiting so this was a really um, important opportunity for them to spell out their plans. Uh, Sir Keir Starmer the leader of the Labour Opposition Party he'll be speaking tomorrow but today was really important uh, because we heard from the shadow chancellor Rachel Rees and it's incredibly important because the Conservative Party are trying to convince uh, the United Kingdom not to back Labour because they will bankrupt Britain quote-unquote there has been a series of local councils across England and in Wales actually that have been bankrupted under uh, the Labour leadership uh, so basically the Conservatives are pitting up um, the, the, the Labour Party to be um, a, a, a party that you cannot trust um, with your uh, money um, and that's why the kind of rousing uh, reception uh, that Rachel Reeves got this morning is important especially because just before she hit the stage there was a video message played out by Mark Carney now people will remember that Mark Carney was the former uh, Bank of England governor just before Andrew Bailey took over the reins there very very well respected on the global scene and he said look you know um, forget whatever you've heard Rachel Reeves is a serious economist and she is somebody that he believes should be given a chance to get all of her um, ideas out in the British public that has got to have been a big sting for uh, Rishi Sunak because of course he is an economist he was once the Chancellor he's certainly um, amongst that crowd so I don't think it would have gone down too well in the Tory party that Rachel Rees was given that resounding uh, reception and she just went on uh, to talk about some of her plans now if you are in the UK if you, or if you follow UK news you'll know that lots of people have been saying hang on a minute Labour have been very policy light we don't know exactly what they are going to be doing with the economy uh, besides giving away lots of free money um, and invest in in lots of green projects she kind of steered away from those two topics though of course she did speak about the cost of living crisis and the fact that Labour are going to try try and make it much more easier on British households. Other areas of note is that um, she says she is going to be saving on uh, consultants in Westminster I think especially during Partygate we started noticing that there are lots of people that are making lots of money uh, for giving one day advice in um, Westminster she says she's going to cut that and saving about a billion pounds annually also she says under her leadership um, there will be a COVID corruption commissioner. Now, we still haven't got all of um, the issues that we faced during COVID out in the open. It is going through an intense scrutiny at the moment. We're expecting uh, Boris Johnson and Matt Hancock, who was the health secretary at the time, still to be pulled in front of the courts to account for where the money went. Lots of fraudulent schemes. She said she's going to be tackling that and she'll also be clamping down on ministerial private, ministerial private jets and several other um, items. But it was really important because, as I said, you know, the Labour Party are seen as the government in waiting. And I think the fact that Rishi Sunak has been trying to downplay Rachel Reeves's efforts um, have been completely thrown um, out of the water now that we had that uh, pretty uh, solid statement from the former Bank of England governor giving her the thumbs up. Right, we'll, we'll definitely keep uh, tracking that story there. But uh, to the banking industry now, see, Metro Bank uh, struck a deal to raise extra funds from investors uh, that, that will secure its, its future. How are investors uh, reacting to this? 
Well, um, their share price is up, actually. One of the reasons why the UK Blue Chip Index is holding on um, in positive territory is because of Metro Bank. I think their shares are up about 17% earlier this morning, and that's because yesterday evening it was announced that a deal had been struck with investors to save Metro Bank. Now, late last week, um, there was some breaking news that Metro Bank were uh, trying to sort out their debt by uh, raising over £660 million. That sent shockwaves through the city of London. Lots of people going back to what happened to Silicon Valley Bank in um, early uh, this year. And they, of course, don't want that replicated here in the United Kingdom. Metro Bank tried to reinsure investors by saying, look, we've had growth consecutive over the past uh, three quarters, but we're just in a little bit of trouble. Investors have saved them. So as of today and as of right now, uh, customers are able to go into the bank and withdraw their money if they would like, though, of course, Metro Bank don't want to see that. They haven't been away from the headlines. There have been a series of issues um, that have affected them since they opened in 2010. In fact, they were the first new bank to open on British high streets in more than 150 years. And I think that's one of the reasons why regulators and consumers have been a little bit patient for them, uh, because it's very difficult to infiltrate or disrupt uh, the banking system here in Britain, which they've able to do so successfully. I think they have over two 2.3 million customers. They have branches across the UK, whilst other branches have been closing. It's very difficult to go and find a bank on your high street these days. A metro bank you can actually go into. Um, so, yes, yeah, so that's what's happened. They managed to receive £925 million from investors yesterday. That's how much they raised. They only needed 660. Uh, so, for now, um, they're out of the water and quite safe. Out of the water and quite safe. But how are the stocks reacting? Yes, yeah, so the FTSE All Share at intraday is up 0.15%, Laddie. The FTSE 100 is up 0.57%, but the FTSE 250, the domestic market, that's down 0.27%. Goes without saying, as you were saying at the top of the show, um, that the conflict currently underway between Israel and Hamas has pushed up the oil prices, although we know that uh, airlines are really suffering no flights in or out of Tel Aviv. In currencies, the British pound is trading down against the US dollar by 0.26%, also down against the euro by 0.02 percent and down against the japanese yen by 0.28 percent at intraday laddie all right juliana thank you so much uh, for that update catch you again tomorrow thank you all right let's um, head on to europe now see paris fashion week uh, closed just a few days ago but uh, many of the luxury brands on display seem to have lost their shine that's because the stocks europe luxury uh, 10 index has just posted its largest uh, quarterly slide since 2020 for more now uh joining us is cassandra Sunt, uh, right there from uh, berlin great to have you cassandra so tell us more uh, about what stocks are on the decline and some of the potential causes of the slowdown Thanks for having me, Lottie. Well, this luxury index mainly includes fashion brands like LVMH, Hermes, and Burberry. But also there are luxury goods, there's a luxury goods holding company called Richemont, uh, and their business is essentially investing in other luxury businesses. The index also includes, I should say, car maker Ferrari. So this slide that you mentioned, it's significant. We have seen $175 billion knocked off the value of these 10 stocks since the end of March, with the sector being sharply derated in the last two to three months. The reasons will sound familiar to a lot of viewers because they are economic factors that have affected many sectors, namely rising interest rates, inv investor positioning, and anticipations of earnings cuts. Notably, the slow economic rebound in China has been a big factor in why these stocks have not performed to expectations. So if you're the type of person who likes to see the glass half full, you might note that the index is still up 20% compared to the same time last year, but the third quarter saw its worst quarterly performance on record relative to the stock 600, which fell to and a half percent. All right, stepping back now, what do these figures tell us about consumer appetite? One thing that jumped out at me from this data was 
who was rising as these companies were taking a hit. Notably, the luxury group LVMH was unseated as Europe's most valuable listed company last month. And who took over that coveted position? Well, it was Novo Nordisk. That's the Danish drug maker who manufactures the anti-obesity drug Wegovy, which has become very popular as a way to lose weight for many people. And the fall here shows that some analysts are becoming more cautious on the luxury sector because shoppers in the U.S. and Europe are spending less than they were immediately following the pandemic. Credit card data from the U.S. has shown that luxury fashion spending was down 16 percent year on year in July and August. All right, we've spoken a bit about luxury stocks, but what else are investors looking out for today in the market? Well, European equities rose Monday in London, but fell in Frankfurt and Paris on the opening bell. London's benchmark FTSE 100 index climbed 0.3%. The Frankfurt DAX lost half a point, and the Paris CAC CAC lost, CAC 40 lost 0.2 percent. Investors are eyeing surging oil prices after Hamas launched a shock attack on Israel over the weekend. There are concerns that a long and difficult war would bring Iran into the conflict and have an impact on oil flows in the region. This follows output cuts from key producers Saudi Arabia and Russia. All right. Thank you so much, Cassandra Sunt, uh, DW TV channels uh, and Channel TV correspondent. Thank you so much. All right, so we'll take a break now. When we come back, more stories from the African continent. That's in a moment. Do stay with us. Welcome back. Well, climate change is top on the agenda right now, even at the IMF World Bank uh, meeting, as this impacts food security in Africa. Let's hear more now from Bountiful Ataco MD, uh, Alana Green Limited. Great to have you on the show. Thank you for having me, ladies. Good to be on the show. Fantastic. So big meetings are happening um, right now from IMF World Bank uh, meeting in Marrakesh. And uh, food security in Africa will be talked about. Uh, that's for how can we you know, solve the funding issue for um, smallholder farmers to start with? Yeah, so um, typically um, Africa faces a huge challenge uh, with agricultural finance. Uh, we have an issue for infrastructure. We have an issue for uh, security, as it were, in a large uh, portion of Africa. But the thing is, there is hope, you know, for the solutions because uh, we can leverage on development organizations uh, to to uh, help smallholder farmers through the private sector. Now, it's going to be initiatives led and directed by private sector uh, and they're funded by development organizations. We can also call on uh, big investors, people. Who are companies who are looking to expand? I say, look, Africa is ready for expansion. Now we can do this through a people-centric approach. We uh, have found that there's a pattern to uh, our funding uh, in Africa. We apply a copy and paste model, um, a model where because it's been tried globally, we just bring it down and then forget that Africa has its own terrain and its own challenges. Um, I feel strongly that. If we can um, build models that that are that are for our smallholder farmers, because our, our surrounding or our environment is peculiar, um, these models will quickly upscale, and um, we can start to sort our issues around agriculture. Um, Governor, in the past, we've had a lot of interventions from the past um, CBN leadership. Would you still like to see more interventions in the agri sector from the Central Bank of Nigeria? And what kind? Yeah, so, so the, the role of the CBN in agriculture cannot be, you know, overemphasized. We cannot downplay their role. The CBN is very important in driving agriculture in the country. Also, let's remember that uh, agriculture accounts for 24 percent of the GDP, and it has prospects, you know, to grow the economy massively. At the time, um, we the, the AFDB projects that in 2030, agriculture will be over one trillion dollars. Now, uh, the CBN should drive development in um, agriculture, but they can do this through financing organizations that have track records of doing these things. So we found that from past initiatives of the CBN, for example, the Anchor Grower programs and that, that um, 
CBN is funding people who we in the industry like to call political farmers or people who are rent seekers. So we find that organizations who are actually doing the job, who have challenges with finance, can have access to the CBN. Now, what CBN can also do is to find initiatives for uh, DMBs that would, you know, cushion the cost of uh, their risks in giving um, loans and lendings to small businesses. All right, thank you so, so much. Of course, have, so, of course, under the leadership of uh, Yemi Kadoso, we want to see uh, more integration from the CBN, but we want to see it getting done the right way. Get it done uh, the right way. Thank you so much. Uh, Bountiful uh, Taco, MD, Alana Green uh, Limited. Thank you for your perspective today. Thank you for having me, Lady. All right, so all the stories in Africa now. We see South Africa is currently dealing with an egg shortage. Grocery retailers have been limiting the number of eggs shoppers can buy due to an ongoing outbreak of avian flu in the country. The high pathogenic avian influenza, a bird flu, spreads rapidly in an infected flock and can cause um, high death rate. According to South Africa uh, Poultry Association, eggs remain the fourth largest animal product sector in agriculture in South Africa after poultry, uh, meat, beef and uh, milk. Meanwhile, some farmers say this has impacted them negatively. Take a listen. Uh, the avian flu has affected poultry producers in South Africa, especially the areas that are mostly affected by it. Um, I'm from Bumalanga and I know the impact has been greatly felt by us and um, the poultry producers. I have been affected by it because now I struggle to get fertile eggs because I hatch my own day old chicks. So now, because of this avian flu that has affected the breeder farm, farms from um, bigger commercial farmers, now we cannot get fertile eggs. And as well as farmers who are from Bumalanga who are relying for on suppliers for day old chicks, they're also feeling the, the heat because now they cannot get the day old chicks, meaning um, they cannot now grow the chickens. And we are approaching festive seasons where money is actually made, but because of this avian flu, everything is a standstill and nobody can get um, the day old chicks and the fertile eggs. It has really affected our pockets and most importantly, our profits. We, uh, as farmers, uh, are struggling as much as you've seen with the community, uh, struggling with the, to cope with the prices, uh, the increased prices of eggs. And very soon, there will be a challenge with access to poultry meat uh, because we're now having a problem with our farmers being unable uh, to get uh, 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 fertilized eggs so that they can grow uh, their chickens, uh, hatch them, and then uh, grow their chickens. And uh, some of our hatcheries are beginning to have a problem uh, getting uh, their fertilized eggs to hatch for, for their clients who are mainly growers in the industry. I just got a call from a farmer now in Mulanga province asking me if there's any uh, situ uh, situation where the government will be coming to assist. And I said to him, he must uh, put it uh, in writing and send it to our chief operations officer because we're compiling a list of all the smallholder farmers uh, who are struggling uh, to uh, carry it on with their businesses. And we have also uh, noticed that uh, government is talking to established farmers. They haven't uh, really taken uh, cognizance of smallholder farmers. Uh, and Kenya's uh, borrowed up to 19.9 billion shillings worth of airtime through the Safaricom Felisa overdraft program uh, during the four months to March this year, pointing to a growing over-reliance on credit facilities in biting economic times. This latest sustainability report, Kenya's giant uh, telco indicated that since opening the lines of credit to enable uh, consumers and customers use the Felisa to buy airtime via the mobile money platform M-Pesa, uh, an additional 19.9 billion in the overdraft service uh, turnover had been unlocked as at the close of the fiscal year on March 31st this year. As Zimbabwe has introduced a new gold-backed digital currency as it battles to stop re-dollarization, uh, which President Emerson Mwangagwa's uh, government fears will spell doom for the country's fragile economy. Uh, the country's central bank says the digital tokens, also known as Zimbabwe Gold, ZIG, uh, that are dominated in milligrams can be used by both individuals and corporates to transact. 
And that's the show today. Thank you so much uh, for watching. Don't forget to uh, watch again on our YouTube channel. Just flip over to YouTube, search for Channel Television. You can watch our videos or get updates on www.channelcv.com. From me and the team right here in Lagos HQ, it's bye for now.